Hi, I'm Certified Master Locksmith and Certified Master Safe Technician Brian Costley. This is Sergeant and Greenleaf's Model 2740B High Security Electromechanical Combination Safe Lock. It's the perfect match for GSA approved security containers and today we're going to be installing it on this Class 5 map and plan file. This is the 274400. That simply means it's a package with the lock body, dial, ring, and all accessories needed to complete your lock installation. This is your documentation package, installation instructions, operating instructions, low battery warning label, and this little manila envelope contains the serial number for this particular lock. In the box we find various accessory packs. For instance, here's a grounding wrist strap. This is a, a one-time use disposable version. Loctite 242 thread locker to make sure all the screws stay nice and tight. Various screws, change key, spline key, spline key screw. Uh, some of the accessories for our dial and of course the two batteries that the lock requires. Before we do the installation we need to take note of the date stamps in four of the different parts and it would be a good idea to record these dates for each part in the service record that stays with the security container. For instance, this is the dial ring and this is the date stamp, month and year of manufacture. This is the lock body. The date of manufacture is stamped in the case at the end of the boltway, again by month and year of manufacture. Here is the date stamp in the cover and just like the others, it's month and year of manufacture. And finally, we have a date stamp on our dial. It's rather difficult to see right here. And of course, just like the others, month and year of manufacture. We've removed the entire door panel so that we can see the whole mechanism and get a better view during the installation process. Normally, you'd simply be working through a, a much smaller area. This lock mounting box uses raised studs, and this is where we'll attach the mounting screws for the lock body. We can use this flat cover from a discarded mechanical lock. It's a nice flat metal surface. We'll put it up against these studs and see if it rocks excessively. If it did rock, that would tell us we had uneven mounting studs and we'd need to shim underneath one or more when we mounted our lock body. This one feels pretty good. So also, uh, we will use this plate as a stop for the depth probe on a set of dial calipers to measure door thickness. Holding the flat metal plate against the mounting studs, I insert the depth probe for my dial calipers through the spindle hole and bring the base of the calipers right up against the front of the door surface. And I see my door thickness is 1.150 inches. The reason we measure the door thickness is because we may use that measurement later when we size the dial spindle to length. This particular container uses an extension which is attached to the end of the combination lock bolt and it interacts with the bolt work in the door itself to provide a solid blocking mechanism. So we need to attach this extension to the end of the combination lock bolt. The container manufacturers provided two screws. There are holes drilled and tapped in the end of the combination lock bolt and those are drilled for 1032 attaching screws. So let's put the extension on the bolt. Here's one of the screws that's provided. We will put a drop of Loctite 242 thread locker, which is provided with your 2740 lock kit. We'll put a drop on the threads of that screw, and then using a hex driver, we'll install that screw. And before we get it tightened up, We'll install the second screw. Let me line that up just a bit. And of course, once we have the second screw installed, we'll go back and tighten both screws. Then our extension will be in place on the lock body. We'll make sure the internal threads on our mounting studs are cleaned out. And I'll do that on all four studs. And then what I like to do is take just a drop of the thread locker and put it inside the threaded holes in the studs. That way we won't take any chances on getting thread locker inside the lock body where it cannot do any good.
Now without wasting any time, we'll put the lock body in the mounting box and attach the mounting screws at each of the corner locations. Just put the screws in loosely at first. Once we have all the screws installed, we'll go back and tighten at each corner and we'll tighten diagonally so that we kind of equalize the stress on the lock case. Packaged with your 2740B lock kit are two different lengths of dial ring mounting screws. These are 832 screws. You should use the longer screws if the holes drilled and tapped into the front of the container are deep enough to permit it, otherwise use the shorter screw. Each one of those screws must be used with a lock washer underneath. This is a flat external tooth lock washer. This is the only difference really in the installation between the 2740A product and the 2740B. The B does absolutely require the lock washers underneath the heads of the dial ring screws. I've got one dial ring screw in the top already installed and now I'm going to insert the bottom one and note that I'm leaving the screws loose for now so there is play or available movement in the dial ring on the front of the door. Next step is to thread the spindle into the drive cam. Before I do that I drop this coil spring over the spindle then this metal washer, and now the plastic washer. Holding the drive cam from inside the container, I'll thread the spindle through the spindle hole into the drive cam, and I'm going to turn it all the way in as far as we can get it to go. Now as the dial gets close to being seated in the ring, we want to go slowly, smoothly, so that those washers will work their way right up onto the spindle hub on the underside of the dial. If you meet resistance, that means they're blinding, they're caught, just back off a bit and then slowly go forward again until those bearings center themselves. You notice if you show a little patience, they'll put themselves right up over that hub where they need to be. Now instead of positioning the dial as I normally would, I purposely tighten it down until it's snug in the ring, until I meet resistance. And then what I do is, because this dial ring is loose on the front of the container, I'll wiggle it a little bit with my fingers, tighten it, not real tight, but just snug. And then I'll check again to see if there's any play in the dial ring until I get to the point where there is no play. Now I'll check, see the relative height of the top surface of my dial relative to the height of this ring that runs around the dial ring. And if it seems pretty uniform, that's probably where my dial ring wants to be. Next thing I'll do is I'll tape it in place so that it won't move until I get a chance to fasten it down. Now with the dial, holding the dial ring right where we want it, we we'll use some masking tape, or in this case, painter's tape, and just fasten the ring into position. Now I can mark where to cut my spindle, right where it comes through the outside surface of the drive cam. Once I have that marked, I can unthread the dial, make my cut, my spindle will be the correct length. So I took my marked spindle and cut it off and chamfered the ends so that it will be able to thread into the drive cam very easily again. Don't throw away this extra piece of spindle because we'll have a use for that in a little bit. Here's an alternate method for marking where we should cut our spindle. You remember we measured our door thickness at 1.150 inches. To that dimension we add 1.26 inches, just a shade over one and a quarter inches, 
and we get a total now of 2.410 inches. I've extended the depth probe on my calipers to that amount. And now I place the end of the depth probe on this ridge near the base of the spindle hub and mark my cutting location on the spindle. If I cut here, my spindle length should be correct for this door. Now that we have our spindle cut to length, remember our dial ring is still taped in the correct position on the front of the door. I can remove these dial ring attaching screws, put a drop of Loctite 242 thread locker on the threads and reinstall them and snug them down. Remember, each one must have a lock washer underneath. I'm not actually putting the uh, Loctite on this time because I'm going to show you an alternate method for aligning the dial ring. Here's another method of aligning the dial ring to the lock body. This uses a homemade dial ring alignment tool. It's just a piece of straight scrap 5 16 by 40 thread per inch lock spindle and onto it is threaded a drive cam where the drive pin has been removed. You can drill the drive pin out or sometimes you can simply use diagonal cutters to pull the drive pin out. Notice that the neck of the drive cam is roughly the same diameter as the center of the swivel bearing in the center of the dial ring. Now I can thread the spindle through the door into the drive cam once I have at least half an inch of it threaded in, I can simply tighten the drive cam and it will help to pull the dial ring into alignment with the lock body. As I begin to get snug, I see if there's any play in the ring, and there is. So I take that up by turning the drive cam. I check for a little more play, take that up, check for a little more play until there's virtually none. Now I can simply align the opening index straight up and down so it looks good on the door. And I'm ready to install my dial ring attaching screws with their lock washers and the 242 thread locker. Now I can simply unthread my dial ring alignment tool and my dial ring is fastened in the proper position. Just before I install the dial, I like to take, uh, this is not a mandatory lubrication point, but I like to take a very thin film of AeroShell 22 and wipe that onto this portion of the spindle hub where it will bear inside the dial ring bearing. Again, this is not a mandatory lubrication point, but it's something I think just makes the lock run a little bit smoother. Now we're ready to install the dial. Now we place the dial in the dial ring, thread the spindle through the safe door into the drive cam, and on the inside of the safe, I'm holding the drive cam stationary so it doesn't rotate. Again, we need to work smoothly without a lot of force to allow the washers, both the metal one and the plastic one, to seat themselves up over the spindle hub. And it feels like they're in place. We're going to leave this dial so that it's slightly raised above this ridge that runs around the perimeter of the dial ring and I'm going to place zero at the opening index. Now I can feel I'm holding the drive cam inside the safe and I can feel that there's a little binding in the dial so I'm going to back it out one full revolution then I'll go to the inside and temporarily install the spline key. Remember that the dial is at zero. Holding the dial in that position I manually rotate the drive cam until this opening or the gate 
is lined up underneath the lever nose so that the lever can move freely up and down. In that position, you can see I nearly have alignment of this spline keyway in the drive cam and this spline keyway in the spindle. So I rotate the dial just a little bit to get better alignment. And now I can only insert the spline key in one orientation in order to line up one of these two openings with a small drilled and tapped hole in the drive cam. Once I've pushed it in as far as I can with my fingers, I take this piece of spindle that we cut off earlier. I use it as a nice soft punch. And using a lightweight hammer, I seat the spline key flush with the top surface of the drive cam. The spline key is seated and as I turn the dial, I'm a little uncomfortable because I feel a very slight rubbing between the dial and the ring. So I need to take one more turn out of the drive cam. To remove the spline key, I insert the longer of the two lock cover screws. And as I turn it in, it pulls the spline key out of its connection. Now I can remove the screw and I can reuse this spline key. Now I can hold the drive cam in place and turn the dial from outside one full revolution counterclockwise to thread the spindle slightly out of the drive cam. Now just like before, I have the spline keyways very closely aligned. I can push in the spline key. I can make sure that it's seated flush against the drive cam and check the condition of the dial again. Much better. Now that I have the uh, dial adjusted just about the way I want it, I'm going to fasten the spline key in place with this little bitty 256 screw. Notice I put a little bit of Loctite 242 thread locker on it. Now I put it through the ear on the spline key that mates with the drilled and tapped hole in the cam. And just snug it down. Not really tight, but certainly snug. And then I've got a little bit of excess Loctite and I'll just rub that off. Now our spline key will definitely stay in place and the dial action still feels really good. Time to install the batteries in the cover. Notice that I'm wearing my grounded wrist strap. It's attached to a piece of metal on the lock cover. We have two batteries. One is a lithium coin cell. It installs in this holder, positive side up. It's a friction fit, so it needs to be pressed into place. Typically, we put in the coin cell first, although in the S&G model 2740B, it really isn't critical which battery you put in first, but it is critical that you install the batteries within one minute of each other. Now install a camera type battery, which is also a lithium cell. And when I install it, you'll hear a single beep. And after about 10 seconds, while the lock is doing a battery test, it will beep again and that will tell us the battery test has been successful and the cover is ready to be installed on the lock case. Let's take a look at uh, some other battery conditions. Here's what happens if you only install one battery and do not install the second battery within one minute. Now we won't make you wait a full minute. Through the magic of video we'll shorten the time frame. get 10 beeps, it'll pause, and then we'll get another 10 beeps, pause, and another 10 beeps. If we were to ignore this signal and install this cover on the lock, the lock would most likely operate one time, and then it would seize with the bolt retracted, and uh, you'd have to use a special device to release the bolt in order to remove the cover and install the batteries properly. You might also get this signal if you install both batteries within one minute of each other, but one battery is bad. So if you get this uh, low battery or battery warning signal, 
It's best to take both batteries out, let the cover sit for one minute, and then reinstall both batteries and see if you don't get a good battery check signal. Now that we have our batteries installed and we've received good battery check signals, it's time to put the cover on the installed lock body. So it simply goes in this way so that our pin connector on the cover mates with the receptacle on the body. We have two different length cover screws. The label tells you that the longer screw goes in this hole, shorter screw goes in this hole. Each screw must use a lock washer. We do not put Loctite on either one of these screws. We'll install this one just barely snug, put the other one in, and then go back and tighten each. When I first dial the lock after installation, it gives me a calibration signal. Three beeps, pause, three beeps, pause, three beeps. Whenever I turn the dial in either direction, I get that signal. And that's the lock telling me that it must be calibrated right to zero and it must be calibrated left to zero before it will perform any operation. So let's get it into the calibration mode. Starting anywhere on the dial, I turn it to the right. I get a long beep. I keep turning to the right. I get another long beep. Now listen. I had one short beep followed by four short beeps. The four short beeps tell me that the battery condition is A-OK. -okay. If I heard two beeps rather than the four, it would tell me batteries were at about half level, and it might be time to think about replacing batteries, but that's a long way off in this lot. So let's go through this process again, and we'll proceed right on to the calibration. One long tone, two long tones, three long tones, the short beeps, and now I continue dialing right to exactly zero. When I get to zero, I dial in the opposite direction to zero. If I pass it when I meant to stop on it, I just keep going to it again. Once I dial exactly to zero, I go in the opposite direction to zero. I repeat that process, just going back and forth to zero. I went too far that time, so I keep going around. I got five beeps, and that tells me that the lock is properly calibrated to zero, and it's ready to be put through some of its paces now. Now that we've calibrated the dial to zero, we'll dial in the factory default combination of 50, 25, 50. We dial at least two revolutions to the left, stop on 50. Now we can dial directly to 25. Now we can dial directly back to 50. Turn the dial right, and within one and a half revolutions, the dial will come to a stop, indicating that the bolt is retracted. And that's how simple it is to dial a Sargent and Greenleaf Model 2740B. A low battery or battery malfunction condition is indicated by the lock beeping 10 times, pausing, beeping 10 times, pausing, and beeping another 10 times. If your batteries are getting weak, this typically happens after a combination is dialed and the lock opens. Here we have a lock with only one battery installed, and I can go ahead and dial the combination. It's on the factory shipping combination of 50, 25, 50. There's 50, there's 25. By the way, if I pass 25 when I meant to stop on it, I can just go around again. I go back to 50. I went past it a little bit, so I'll just go around again. 
turn back in the opposite direction to retract the lock bolt. The lock bolt is now retracted, but we're in a lock open latch condition where we cannot turn the dial far enough to re-extend the lock bolt. We'll see what that looks like from the inside of the safe. Here's what lock open latch looks like from the lock's point of view. We simply cannot extend the lock bolt far enough to lock the container. So it's impossible to lock up this safe. However, we can reset from a lock open latch using what's called a 444 device. It's very simple. It has a snap connector for a 9 volt battery. So we'll install that battery and then on the other end it has a plug that fits into the change key receptacle in the back of the lock. And listen to what happens when we plug it in. Did you hear the motor run? This was resetting the lock from lock open latch. Now when I turn the dial, the lock bolt can extend. And with the lock bolt extended, we'll be able to remove the cover and correct whatever the battery condition is. This is the dial ring dust cover for the 2740B. Note it has the 111 decal, and that's what helps differentiate the 2740B from its predecessor, the 2740A. It simply slides over the dial ring. There is an opening here through to a tapped hole in the dial ring into which we'll insert a small set screw. We have exactly the same type of arrangement over on this side. So I'll put a small drop of uh, Loctite 242 thread locker on those two 440 screws and install them. Once we've finished our installation and we've checked the lock and we're certain everything is working correctly and the dust cover has been installed, it's time to mark the V-notches. There's a V-notch on this side of the dial ring and one on the opposite side of the ring. We place a pointed punch high up in the V, strike it to create a dot. We do the same thing on the other side. Now if our dial ring subsequently gets bumped and moved, we can use the dots in the V's to help realign the dial ring long enough to dial the combination, open the container, and then correct any problems that may have resulted from the dial ring being bumped. Our installation is almost finished. We've put the orange battery warning label on the inside of the back panel. This tells the end user that if they open the lock and as it's opening, it emits 10 beeps, pauses, emits 10 beeps, pauses, emits 10 beeps. That's indicating a low battery condition and batteries should be changed as soon as possible. The end user will get this low battery signal approximately 100 times before the lock goes into lock open latch and the unit will not be able to be locked again and that will force battery change and also a reset using the 444 device. So we'll go ahead and attach the back panel and put in the lock access plate and then we'll be done.